Okay, good morning everyone, almost good noon. Thank you very much for attending today's talk. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Ahmad Sobeh, and I'm going to be talking about the F in FOSS, in other words, affording open source in developing countries. Okay, a quick homoi about me. Uh, my name is Ahmad Sobeh, as I just mentioned. I am an engineering manager at Ivan's open source program office, working on several open source projects. I have worked with and led diverse teams throughout my career, which started back in the country where I was born and raised, Egypt, a country that tries and has been trying to be developing for quite some time. And we will delve a little bit today into what that actually means. And below you can find some links to my social stuff. So a quick background about today's uh, topic. So as someone who has really strong ties with their community and their home country, Today I'm going to be talking about some issues that you might not relate to, struggles that you might find a bit trivial, and I'm going to be suggesting some solutions that you might think are already implemented everywhere. But I can assure you that they're not. As I, as I mentioned, as someone who has strong ties to their community and their home country, there is this bemusement to the idea of an OSPO and working on open source, a company supporting open source projects without having direct beneficial, uh, well, financial beneficials to the company. Whenever I talk with people with the, from the tech industry or any other industry, basically, in my country, there's this bemusement usually, and I understand that, and I can relate to it because it was the situation I was in at some point, not understanding the point of open source, the point of doing a company working on stuff that's for other people, not for the company's benefit. There are lots of challenges that led to this, there are a lot of challenges to overcome, to change the situation, and this is what we're going to delve into today. We'll start with a quick definition. What is a developing country? And does it actually mean what it meant before? Because the term has changed and evolved over time. Back when it was first coined in 1960 by Walt Whitman, uh, not Walt Whitman the poet, not Walter White's alter ego, a different Walt Whitman, uh, in his classical piece, The Stages of Economic Growth, where he divided countries into two categories, developing countries and developed countries. So countries that meet a specific economical and financial uh, metric or threshold are considered developed. The rest of the countries are considered countries that are on their way to being fully developed at some point in the future. But this has changed a bit now. The term became an umbrella for different types of countries, starting with countries that are actually developing, so countries that have the means, the financial power or the financial uh, ladder to get there, and the option of a free government, and hopefully they will be, become fully developed in 10, 20, 30 years, depending on their situation. The countries that are still trying to develop, but not actually getting anywhere. So countries that are missing some parts of the equation, some ingredients of the recipe. They keep trying to develop. They've got initiatives. They've got several attempts, but they're not getting anywhere. And yeah, that's the situation that they're in. And then you have countries that are stagnant. And as a native Arabic speaker, the Arabic language has a very direct way, an accurate way of describing things. And the term stagnant does not do the situation that these countries are in justice. The term in Arabic, it's called al المتخلفة, which means countries that have been left behind, which is exactly the situation these countries are in. The world has developed, the world has changed, let alone, I mean, in terms of um, society, culture, civilization, this is another thing, but specifically and accurately for this situation, technologically. The world has evolved technologically and the well, technical divide or the digital divide between the rest of the world and these countries is massive. It's much bigger than you actually think. Which takes us to the next topic, which is the current state of open source in these countries. I'm a huge believer in storytelling and using stories to deliver the message and actually show you the current perception of open source in these countries and the associations that people make with open source and with software being actually free. I have two examples with people from different backgrounds, different, uh, different technical experiences, working at different stages in their career. The first one is someone who works at one of the biggest tech corporates on the planet, working on one of the biggest open source projects on the planet. This project was, by the way, built on two other open source projects, but people working at that tech company usually forget that, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, this person is quite angry and takes to Twitter and says they stole our work and they're building new stuff with it. So this is someone that I semi-personally know, born and raised in a, also in a developing country. And what happened is another tech giant came and took this open source project, 
put something on top of it, and now they're selling it as a product that is changing how we all perceive the internet nowadays. And this person is quite angry about this, and they're saying that the work was stolen and used to build new stuff. Random stranger asks on Twitter too, isn't that the whole point of open source? And the person replies again saying, maybe it is, but it's still stealing in my view, which shows a complete lack of understanding of what open source is, lack of understanding of what is working in open source project and how that enables others to produce stuff. Second situation is from a team meeting that I was personally in eight or nine years ago before I understood what open source is. I understood some of it, but not the full picture. One of the few open source enthusiasts that I met at my country asked this question, what does open source mean to you? And the, the answers that you're gonna see will show you the first associations made with open source in these regions. It's free software that I can use without paying. That's the first association that's made. It's free. I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to go through, through uh, payroll or finance to ask for the software. I can just install it, which is not inaccurate. It's not incorrect. But the following associations are the problem. Second answer was, I got to check with IT before I install any of those. That's the first thing that they thought of. It's not safe. I got to check with the security team before I use any of those. It's not safe. It's not secure, which is completely incorrect because some of the biggest products on the planet depend on open source projects. I wouldn't say on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a second-to-second -second basis. And they rely on the accuracy of these projects on a second-to-second -second basis. And then there is my answer. I don't have to wait for the next release. I can fix the bug myself locally, which is a bit selfish, to be honest. But yeah, I mean, I'm not very proud of my answer. But still, <laughs> none of these answers touch the main essence of open source. None of them touch sustainability or collaboration or transparency. None of them come close describing what is the actual benefit of open source. So now, in the original version of this talk, uh, it was 45 minutes, and I delve into each specific region and how open source is in all of these regions. But I chose one continent to talk about today, the one I am actually from. This is the, the current situation of open source contributions currently in Africa. As you can see, in 2010, almost half the contributions of open source, on GitHub specifically, came from South Africa, which makes sense because South Africa is one of the more developed countries in the, on the continent. But this was challenged by growth of open source contributions from Kenya, from Nigeria, and also from Egypt, reaching in 2020 that uh, uh, Kenya is leading the way with South Africa in second place when it comes to contribution, Nigeria third place, and Egypt in fourth place. So you might be wondering what's wrong with this picture. This looks good. Um, contributions are diverse, diversifying. Other countries are, ch are chipping in. But this is what's wrong with this picture. So this is the percentage of open source contribution, contributions when compared to the entire globe. Less than 0.5% of open source contributions on GitHub came from Africa in 2010, which rose to less than 2.5% in 2020, which is very disappointing when you think of the demographics of the continent. More than 20% of the world's population lives in Africa, and the amount of immense skills and talent that exist in the continent these numbers are very disappointing when you think of that. So you might be thinking, why should we care about any of this? Open source is struggling as it is. We have problems as it is. Why should we care about this? And there's, there are a lot of benefits, either for the open source global community or for us as people living or born and raised in developing countries. And going into the benefits of open source would be a bit trivial because I'm pretty sure everyone who's at this conference already knows the benefits of open source. But there's two specific points that I'd like to stress on. One of them when it comes to the people and the communities living in these countries, and one of them for the global open source community. The first point is solving local issues. Open source would help solve so many local issues that only the people living in these regions, only the people struggling with these issues, issues on a daily basis, in the tech industry or in other industries, they, can only, they are the only people who are be able to solve it, implement solutions for it, and benefit from solving it. But for the global open source community, there is the benefit of, the, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, the immense amount of skills and talent that exists in these regions. And this is not something that the developing world is unaware of. They already know that. Everyone already knows that. Because if you look at the top 10 countries to outsource software development to in 2021, out of the 10 countries, only three of them that you consider either late developing or developed. The rest are all developing countries or underdeveloped countries. So you already know that. You already use these people to outsource software development to because they 
take less wages. Basically, when you think of it, when it comes to corporate life, you want to pay less for the same work. So they can do the same work. They can do it, do it even better in some cases. So you already know that. Changing open source or changing the open source culture or changing how people perceive open source would go through several challenges and lots of different types of challenges. I'm going to divide these challenges into three pillars, which I would say are the main struggles and main challenges because there are still the basic foundations of issues that every human faces on the planet to convince people of open source. This exists everywhere, developing or non-developing. But these issues are the biggest ones that come that, well, that people in these regions face. First is society and culture. Second is resources and infrastructure and economy in general. And the last is the issue of governance. Starting with the issue of society and culture. Unfortunately, we all live in a society. So we have to understand what that comes with. We all know that it's no secret that the tech culture, specifically the open source culture, feeds off the culture of where it exists. It's, that's why you see open source thriving in democratic, free, organized, more developed regions, and it's struggling in other regions. But I want you to think of the perfect open source culture, some utopian dream that you might have of a place where open source would thrive, would grow, would have all the means to be grown, sustained, and maintained. There are three key points that open source, that culture has to have. One, being open and transparent. Information had, has to be freely, as freely and as publicly accessible as possible to everyone in society, which is a huge problem in these regions. Information is usually red tape and is not available to the average civilian, let alone someone who wants to work with open source. Second point has to be free, and free has so many different meanings that we can delve into in the one more hour talking about what free means, but there's freedom of speech, expression, belief in religion, there are so many things, but the most important free freedom aspect is freedom to start communities and start organizations and start smaller people, groups of people working together, because this is the main essence of open source. In my opinion, the most important essence of open source is distributed modes of collaboration in which large groups of people work together without direct authority. That's the main essence of working in an open source project. You don't need someone governing you and telling you what to do. It's only the community that points you where you should be going. The community puts the rules and the community works together towards doing this. This is a huge problem in these regions. Smaller communities and smaller organizations are usually closely monitored, uh, questioned, and unfortunately in some cases prosecuted and even shut down. Last point is dynamic. The culture has to be dynamic and ready to change whenever a new, much better opportunity is presented, which is also a huge problem in these regions. Being resistant to change and preferring to stick with traditional approaches can limit society's willingness to adopt new technologies. And it would be a bit unfair to paint the less developed world with this being resistant to change, because we've seen lots of more developed cultures that are actually uh, resistant to change. So we can ask ourselves why. Why are people in this regions resistant to change? And understanding the reasons behind this, that this is the spe what's special to these regions. Uh, this is how you understand why they're a bit different. It's the fear of the unknown which could be also unfair to paint people from these regions with, because even people in the develop, developed world would be afraid of an unknown certainty or an unknown result. But it's their reasons behind this, which are competence and accountability. That's what's special to these regions. If you imagine a situation where you have someone who owns a store, and they do all their ins and outs and their sales by pen and paper, and you go to them and you suggest they adopt a database solution, open source or non-open source at this point, it's very highly likely that they're going to refuse because they don't trust the technical competence that's available to them. They're not sure this is going to be working as good as pen and paper works. Yes, pen and paper makes them lose time, makes them lose sometimes some information, but still, they've tried it, they rely on it, and they're sure that it's competent. They're not sure of the technical competence that's available to them. And they're not sure that if something goes wrong, there's someone who's going to be held accountable to it. So they just shut it down altogether. They just reject the opportunity completely. And that's the reason behind their fear of change. The next pillar is economy and infrastructure, which is the obvious one. It's the obvious struggle that most of these countries have, starting with 
access issues, access to equipment and access to the internet. The digital divide in these countries is much, much worse than you can imagine. Lots of people live without stable internet, and I'm talking, not talking about normal people working in other industries. No, you've got people who are studying computer science students who do not have access to the internet, and I've, well, stable internet. And I've seen, in my, opinion, in my uh, studies, I've seen people who could not contribute to university projects only on the weekends they could, they could actually do that because throughout the week they don't have access to stable internet. They go somewhere on the weekend where they have access, they can contribute. But that's just the internet. Imagine needing a powerful enough machine to run an open source project, one of the big ones. There is the lack of access, the obvious issue with, fu with funds. You don't have enough money to buy the latest tech, but there's the issue of availability. The latest, most powerful machines are not all available on these markets in the first place which makes it very difficult for education and self-learning. If I decided to take on some open source project, understand how it works, and self-learn, basically, I don't need someone to teach me, I, for lack of access to equipment and the internet, it becomes very, very difficult to do this. And how do you actually create a community like this? You have people, the more privileged, privileged ones, like myself, I had internet, I had good enough tech, I could contribute to start an open source project, I can actually do that. But at the end, you'll find the project running and me, and someone else like me and the rest of the people are just contributing whenever it's possible, which is not really an optimal open source project um, culture or, or situation. Funding, on the same note, projects, as I just said, would depend, would depend on individuals. Individuals would prioritize paid, paid work. The individuals, as I just mentioned, that contribute whenever there's a chance to do that. Once, and I've seen this personally, once the opportunity of paid work arises, even if it's a second job, they will just drop completely contributing to open source projects. Because I've seen people who contribute to open source projects and try to understand them to improve their skills, learn a new stack, or just improve their experience in general. But once the opportunity of paid work arises, they just drop it. And that makes sense. I, can, I need more money to support my family. I'll just focus on what brings me money. I wouldn't be too worried about sustaining an open source project. And lack of funds would make it very difficult to start marketing campaigns, community building events, or even fund documentation, which is essential specifically in these regions because of the next issue. Of course, you can't attract or maintain volunteers. And the next issue I was going to talk about is localization. It becomes very difficult to start your open source journey when the project is, and I know this is surprising for lots of people, is in English. Because English is the language of the internet, it's widely spoken by, every, by everyone, but the number of people living in these countries that do not speak the basic English, and they speak English enough to code, obviously, because coding is in English, but they don't understand, cannot read the documentation of a project, understand how it works. But there's no entry point to the project in these cases for these people. It becomes very, very difficult to get started, and they get really frustrated by not understanding how the project works, and I'm talking about people who've got the technical ability the technical background and experience. They can code and they can code pretty well, but still it becomes very difficult with this issue of understanding how things work because it's a different language. And the time and resources needed would discourage any potential contributor from actually contributing to the project. Last point is governance. And governance is a huge, well, governance is a huge issue in these regions in general, and open source governance is a worldwide problem. So this one's a bit understandable starting with employee contracts. Almost all, and I've been told by friends who live in the US, then the situation is similar, which is surprising for me personally, but almost all tech um, contracts or tech employee contracts are set to monetize every single thought, every th single idea, every single contribution you might make. So this discourages lots of people from actually contributing to any projects because they do not want to get into trouble with their employer. I don't want to be contributing to a project, making a name for myself, and then one day I find an email from HR, we've heard about what you've been doing, you're in trouble. No one wants to be in this situation, so they just ignore the whole thing altogether. Which takes us to the next point, intellectual property laws, which are, are extremely weak in these regions. They're not set to protect your ideas, they're not set to protect your contributions or open source contributions, they're set to protect the companies, they're set to protect the corporates, which is more or less how the world works, but to several degrees in these regions. And for the purpose of time, I would like to delve into more examples about this, but in these regions, it's much, much worse than the rest of the world. And there's, then there's proprietary software deals. Well, companies or tech companies from 
DS from Europe get into 10, 20, 30 year deals with these governments to supply them with their paid or money software, and they cannot get it out of the de these deals. Imagine at some point someone gets elected in the right place and they think this is so much money that we could save by dropping this and adopting uh, Linux. They cannot get it out of the deal. They have to pay a fortune that the country wouldn't be able to afford to get out of these deals, which becomes really difficult. And there is the ugly side of corruption, which exists everywhere. It's not just in these regions. But there are lots of people taking cuts from these deals and try to convince those people to drop this software for free software. If it's free, then they don't get paid. And that's the biggest problem for them. Now, after we've talked about all the issues and all the struggles, there, there are, there's lots that we can do. There's lots that can be done to change this. There's lots that the global community can do. There's lots that governments can do, and we don't think they're going to do, but they might at some point. And there's lots that people living in these regions can do to ease the struggles of open source communities and developers. So, starting with inner source, which in my opinion is, would be, the stepping stone towards open source at some point. You can only convince people by, with something or with a specific idea by showing them the benefits of it. And the only way you could do this in these regions, or in my opinion, the only feasible way or something that can be done on a short scale, two to five year scale, is adopting inner source in organizations, in startups, or in corporates in these regions. By adopting inner source, people will, sh will see the benefits, some of the benefits of open source, at, at least for them, the most crucial one would be cost-cutting measurements that would show them what open source can actually bring to them. Adopting, well, after adopting inner source, there, an open source culture will start to develop internally in these organizations and these startups or in these uh, companies, understanding how to work in a transparent and a collaborative mode. Not, it's not each team working on its own, teams working together, teams collaborating on several projects. It's not open source, but it's still a step towards open source at some point. With adopting inner source, companies or people in companies or in organizations would build open source expertise. Understanding how to manage an inner source pro inner source project is still a step towards knowing how to manage or understanding how to manage an open source project. It's a smaller scale. It's a different. It's a different medium because there isn't this uh, clash of. Well, a clash of benefits, a clash of understanding that would happen in the open source world, but still, it's a very good step or a positive step towards adopting open source, inner source at some point, uh, open source, sorry, at some point. And initiatives will arise, and hopefully, governments, w when they see firsthand the, the benefit of open source, or inner source in this case, they would start actual initiatives towards adopting inner source, uh, open source at some point in the future. Next is government, uh, governance, and this is well, 100% on governments, which hopefully can happen at some point, creating favorable intellectual property laws that would protect open source contributions, would protect developers who contribute to open source, that'd be the first step. Creating partnerships with open source organizations and foundations like Linux Foundation, um, Apache Foundation, Eclipse, partnerships with these organizations to start campaigns and start community building would be very beneficial and supporting community-driven initiatives instead of shutting them down, instead of monitoring them for security, being afraid of some new ideas being implemented in society, supporting them would be much, much better in these cases. And this last point is for everyone in the global open source community. Letting those people in, as I mentioned before, they have a huge amount of skills and talent, letting them into the open source community, understanding their cultural differences, how they bring a new point of view. They have different insights and different opinions on things, which can only be good for the open source community. I can only benefit the open source community, accept their cultural differences. And I would invite everyone to take a look at my colleague, uh, Claude. He's going to talk about cultural relativism, which is exactly about this, working with people from different backgrounds on open source projects. There's also mentorship, which could be a lot to ask in lots of situations, but still, if there is a chance, and I know maintaining an open source project is already hard as it is, but maintaining a project and trying to mentor someone who might lack some, some of the skills matrix would be even more challenging. But still, if you have the time, you have the capacity or the ability to mentor someone that you feel might be a good addition to the project, try to help, try to help them, try to mentor them, and use your languages. If you speak Spanish, that unlocks 
almost all of uh, South America. If you speak Arabic, Allah's a huge portion of the world. Uh, there, there are so many languages. I don't want to talk about the language specifically, but if you speak any other language than English, always try to help people and ease their experience and make their journey towards being an open source developer much easier. So in summary, this might be overwhelming, might be a lot of problems, might be leaving people with the impression of there isn't much I can do it here, but trust me, there is a lot that you can do. There is a lot that can be done to change the situation. In, well, we're, in our countries, we're very aware of the issues and the struggles that we go through, and we are very aware of how dire they are, but we also, we're very aware that the first step towards solving these problems, to overcoming these challenges, is talking about them and being aware of how dire they are and how much they're affecting us. So this is what I'm trying to do, talk about them as much as possible in the hopes this would take us somewhere and make things better, hopefully, in the future. Thank you very much for listening. You can see the QR codes that link you directly to the slides, where you can download them and you can see all the references and the links to the talk that I mentioned. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Really nice insights uh, you. you provided us here. So there is some time for maybe one question. Yeah, and we have one. Thank you very much for um, a really insightful talk. Um, I have a question uh, because I had had a conversation with an open source contributor who is in Africa, and one of his observations uh, of open source communities, um, even among very uh, active contributors, is that uh, he, he observed that contributors who are from more developed countries feel a bigger sense of ownership over the open source projects and the final product, um, whereas uh, his communities that he had interacted with uh, did not seem to have that uh, ownership, that sense of ownership, even, um, even among people who were in communities for years. Uh, is that, would you say that that's a cultural difference? Is that something that maybe n not as, the, the open source projects weren't as inclusive as they should have been, or a mix of things? Um, from your perspective, what would you say that that, is it even a problem, or is it just a cultural difference? Well, thank you for your question. From my perspective, it's, a, as you mentioned, a mix of different things. Inclusivity is, would be, or inclusiveness would be the first thing that I would think of. Uh, be, people being on the fringes of some project is definitely a problem. But there's also the culture issue that's not really, it's just not culture, there are several aspects to it, but most people in these regions will be contributing for a benefit. It's not because that's their culture or that's how they think, but because of their situation. As I mentioned, people will be contributing in university in Egypt, for example, to open source projects to learn a specific stack. So the ownership wouldn't come from a situation like this. If I'm contributing to learn how to code in Java, and I reach the level that I want to reach at some point, then what's going to take me to the next step? What's going to drive me to keep contributing because I got what I wanted from the project? While, whilst people in more developed countries, they don't have this kind of goals. They're interested in what the project offers. They're interested in what kind of issues or problems the project solves. So that's, yeah, I mean, in short, that's probably the biggest problem is eliminating the need for contributing to get something. Just solving the problems that people are facing. If we have an open source project that's based in or started one of these regions, that is going to change a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of this will be changed because when you see people like you starting a project and maintaining it without getting the direct benefit from it, that would change how people think or how people perceive open source in general. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So for the interest of time, uh, we'll wrap up the question session, but I'm sure that Ahmed will be around and you okay. can okay. catch up with him. Um, so let's thank Ahmed thank one more time. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you.